Okay. She. Yeah, please. <clears throat> well, I'm a mess. So, hope God makes something out of it. Amen. How many of you have never heard me? Yes. All right then. We're going to have fun. Are you ready? Okay. Jesus, help. That's one of the most amazing words you can ever say. Help. I've been saved. Um, I'm, I'm 12 years old in Jesus. I still got spiritual huggies on. I'm excited. I'm excited. Hey, Brian and Kathy, get out of here. Dude, I see all these people that I know. That's nuts. Gosh. Jesus, help me. Help me get out what you want to get out here. I came, I came yesterday after a really long, like a, I don't even know how to explain it. It was, it was not just a long trip. It was amazing long. It was a big blur getting here. I'm not complaining about traveling. I love it. I get to. It's amazing. It's beautiful. I get to love Jesus 24-7 wherever I go. No matter what. To me, it's never about ministry. It's about Jesus. To me, it's never been about preaching in front of people. It's been about Jesus. It's never been about trying to make a name. I, 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 I can't stress this enough. It's, it's, never about, it's never about you. It is about you, but you need to be about him so he can be about you. I know. I feel so weird. I said last night, I said, oh my gosh, I'm like in Africa sharing the gospel with people that have chosen a missionary school what do I have to say you're doing it like I'm serious you know I'm, I, I share the gospel all over the world it never changes it's the same yesterday today and forever so no matter where you're at the word never changes it's always the same there are some things that that God has has showed me the first one is that you need to be free from you Okay, they can't hear me very well. I'm trying not to, I'll get louder. It, it, it's, huh? Hi? Can you hear? Yeah? Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, I'm going to get louder. I, I'm, I'm passionate about Jesus because... Like the gospel, the first part of the gospel is that you need to be free from you. The gospel doesn't say, pick up your cross, deny the devil. It doesn't say, deny the devil and pick up your cross. It says, deny yourself. Self is the issue. Selfishness, actually. Me, myself, and I. What can I do for me? And so when I came into this glorious gospel, I realized my whole life was selfish. My whole life was nothing about anybody else but me all I did was hurt people and destroy and you know I I usually always share my testimony wherever I go so that people because once I I start going and start getting into this thing you can't think that wow that's really got loud and okay you can't think that I went to some amazing bible school I like when I got saved I couldn't read so it was pretty crazy. I couldn't, I couldn't understand. I couldn't comprehend. So when, I, when Jesus came into my life, I came out of horrible, 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 actual blindness to seeing, actual dead so I can live, lost so I can be found. But everybody has the same exact testimony. So no matter who you were, no matter how much you've done or didn't do, all of you were lost. All of you were blind. All of you were dead. I don't care if you grew up in church. The problem is is that you think that by growing up in church that you weren't dead. You were. Because there's a time when Jesus comes. But if we don't see that, then we'll think that somebody that has like a testimony, like I have a, you know, I, 
I, I was a drug addict for 22 years. I was an atheist my whole life. And someone that says they were a drug addict for 22 years, and then you that grew up in the church, you'll think that they have a reason to love more than you do because they've been forgiven more than you have. That's not true. The problem is you might not understand that you have been forgiven because you might be revisiting something that Jesus said is finished. I've been saved for 12 years. I've been like set free, sanctified, set apart, like holy given, possessed by Jesus. I just, when I came to Jesus, it was become, it's because he first came to me. But first love, I don't believe that first love is when you get born again. I, I just don't. Because there's a place where you have to grow up into him. And we're always growing up into him. But there is this understanding God loves you. It's different to say, yeah, do you know that God loves you? Yeah, I know. Okay, well, being loved by God is different than knowing that God loves you. Actively being loved by the Father is amazing. Saying that God loves me is a statement. God loves me. Well, he loves everybody with attitude. I hear, hey, do you need to hear the good news? Yeah, yeah, what? God loves you. Yeah, oh, I knew that. I thought you were going to tell me something else that was good. If that's not everything, then you're in trouble. So, so whether you were a drug addict, whether you grew up in church, whether you were an atheist, whether you were you, like the, demi- the demoniac, whether you had 2,000 demons, 3,000 demons, 5,000 demons, and you got set free, each of us were equally forgiven. All of us were equally forgiven. I, I just believe it. Okay, all right. So I'm just going to talk about some good news and then hopefully make something out of it. Are you ready? Okay, cool. I already asked you that. Just checking again. All right. Hey, Will. You're beautiful in blue. Dude, you know last night when you, when you were sharing, you wrecked me, man. Like a, a mess. Huh? I know you do. But I, I, I was totally messed up. And you're like, help pray. No, I'm done. I was just a mess. Because it's all about the Will was there when I had an encounter the first time. He was there. Like, I was at a meeting, and God went, and Will was like, this is awesome. I said, get away from me, dude. (laughs) It was crazy. It was at a Randy Clark meeting. I got touched beyond touched. I thought I was going to die. Randy thought it was funny. It wasn't funny. (laughs) Mm, Okay. All right, I just want to, I want to share my testimony so we can build. All right, you guys good? Okay, for those of you that heard it before, I'm going to say it again. I say it every day somewhere in my life, somewhere on the earth. Because your testimony never gets old and you never can forget where you came from. You always have to know where you came from and understand that. When I talked about first love, I don't believe first love is when you get saved. I believe that that's amazing. God first loved you before you loved him. Yes, that's it. But that's not entering into it. Entering into first love, it's, it's tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. And there's nothing else that tastes good. Like first love is this amazing place where I fall in love with my father because he is so extravagantly good and so amazing that he took something, he took who I was and he removed it as far as the east is from the west. And if you go east in a world that's a circle, you can't hit west. It's so crazy beautiful that the blood of Jesus, it says the blood of Jesus cleanses our conscience from dead works in order to serve God. Your conscience, everything that you, your sin conscience, there's a place where sin consciousness gets removed. See, there's this crazy stuff that's coming into the church called false grace or hyper grace, hyper grace that's saying that once you repent, you've, you've already repented, you don't have to repent again. That's a lie from hell. Repentance is a daily walk. Repentance is a daily lifestyle to where the conscience that Jesus washed and cleansed remains clean by you keeping your heart sensitive, by you keeping your conscience sensitive. So when something's a violation of your conscience, you stamp that thing denied, you don't enter into it, and you flee from you for lust because it doesn't have anything to do with you or you with it. That's where the first love of God is. I, I grow in that place every day. It's not like I've attained anything. But Paul said in Philippians 3, there was one thing that he did attain. And that's where I live and that's where I make my boast. See, where I make my boast is there's one thing I've laid a hold of. One thing. One thing. 
That is forgetting those things that lie behind and pressing on towards those things that God has laid a hold for me for. He's grabbed a hold of me to push me forward to this goal. And the goal is to represent Jesus every day. But I can't really represent him unless I'm free from guilt, shame, and condemnation. You cannot afford to live in a place of guilt, shame, and condemnation or else you are living under an old covenant. But because I'm in a new covenant, that doesn't give me a license to sin because if I'm living in that place where I think I have a license to sin, I don't know God. You can walk in all the miraculous. You can heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. You can stand before the Father and he'll say, I never knew you. And a lot of the church is afraid of miracles because they think that because they healed the sick, it was the devil healing them. It wasn't that. It says you who regarded lawlessness, you who practice lawlessness. See, we are supposed to be an instrument of righteousness, a weapon of righteousness. Righteousness is amazing. Nobody could get it unless they walk out 613 laws and 10 commandments. Because the only way for somebody to be right with God is in their own strength, they have to walk out 613 laws and 10 commandments perfect and never go to the left or to the right. James 2.10 reiterates what the law says. It says that if you transgress one law, you've transgressed them all. So if you walked for 30 years and you were completely perfect, but 30 years and one day in, you trip one time, your whole life is a wash and it's nothing. That was the law and it was, there was no way to do it. So Jesus came and Jesus pays a price for me to enter into two. But if I don't understand the two that I'm supposed to enter into, I will still try to strive to be instead of being to do. I need to understand who I am so that I no longer am in a place of doing to try to be. I'm not a doobie anymore. I, I be to do. See, I be right with God and my doing becomes a byproduct of my being. But I'm not trying to do to be. To be. You can't do enough. Your work's oriented. You'll, you'll be done before you start. And unfortunately, when the miracles and the healings and all that stuff is concerned, when you start to enter into the miraculous, when you get saved, all of a sudden you'll realize that God wants to use you. And it's amazing because everybody is born, and and when you get born again, God wants to use you, he wants to flow through you, but you don't have to be born again for God to flow through you, and that's dangerous. Like the disciples healed the sick and they weren't even saved think with me these dudes they're walking around they're like barbarians they're walking around with jesus he's like i'll choose you and you and you and you and you too judas yeah judas you're in come on let's go i'm gonna give you power go and destroy hell yeah you're gonna betray me this is our father man see no matter who you are you have to be a steward of your own heart but if you don't really know him see the confession of knowing him we can't afford to have the voice or the the language of sonship, but really not understand what it means. And there's a lot of people that use the lingo. But it's not a lingo. It's a relationship. It's, it's my God, my Father. His eyes are always on me every day. And he never looks away and he likes what he sees. And I live with my heart completely before him. And I'm, I'm in love with Jesus. And nobody can get me to compromise this love because nobody gave it to me. It's not for sale. Jesus paid such a high price for me. See, the cross, people teach sometimes that the cross is the revelation of your sin, but it's not true. The cross is the revealing of your value. If you see how important you are and how much the Father paid for you, all of a sudden you realize you're not worthless. You are worth the blood of Jesus. And it never changes. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God made it really easy. He said, here's the two laws that you're going to follow all the days of your life. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. But how can you love your neighbor if you can't love yourself? And how can you love yourself unless you love God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind? And how can you love God with your mind if you can't think like God thinks? You guys all right? Okay. Good luck looking at your notes when we're done. Where did he get? How did he get from here to what? What is wrong? It's not what's wrong. It's what's been made right. Let's come together because it's fun. Are you with me? We need to start here. You need to understand something. 
See, all life comes from God. Whether my mom wanted me, whether my dad wanted me, whether I came through this or came through that or came through this, it doesn't matter. See, the problem is we've elevated psychology and rejection over the acceptance of our father. And we've brought in the way that seems right to a man instead of living according to the way that is right to God, and that's righteousness. Because no matter how I was in the world, no matter how I was born, no matter how I came through, regardless, all life comes from God. It doesn't matter if you were thrown away, if your mom rejected you. The rejection of your mother has nothing to do with the acceptance of your father. And when you get born again, the rejection of life, all that stuff gets crushed when you find out that you have been accepted in the beloved. But if you don't get into that place, you will constantly be trying to root out things that cause rejection instead of living in the simple acceptance of heaven. When you get born again, you get a brand new dad. He's the best dad ever. And no matter what kind of generational curse my grandfather or my great-grandfather or my great-great-great-grandfather, uncle, whatever, no matter what happens, it says that third and fourth generation, a generational curse can come up in. But one life that comes into righteousness leaves a a legacy to a thousand generations. So no matter what, when I get born again, I enter into a brand new bloodline. No matter what it was, and I have the bloodline of Christ, and there's absolutely no generational curse that crosses this one. What if it's true? Because it's biblically sound. It's biblically sound. We've brought all kinds of different things in, and we've become really smart, and we've sought after God trying to read all kinds of different books to get to Him, but not gotten a relationship with the author who reveals the truth that's in this book. It was all written by God. And it's inspired by Holy Spirit. All Scripture is God-breathed and is used for reproof, for correction, for admonishment. It's used for amazing things, but it's all for training into one thing, training in righteousness. And in this life, you are to reign as a king through the free gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace. So that's what it says. It says that one man felt and sin entered into the world. How through the, another one that we might reign through righteousness. Everything changes. Everything shifts. But your focus and your foundation has to be solid or else you'll be trying to go back to fix things that Jesus says are finished. Are you guys Okay. Be like Will and trying to get a response out of you. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go to one scripture here real quick. And then, look, you see? Okay. Oh, where'd it go? Yeah. That's our little baby we're adopting. He was born addicted to heroin four and a half months ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. She. Oh. Okay. Second Corinthians eleven. Verse one. He says, Paul says, Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me. Are you guys with me? Are you there? He says, because for I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. It's amazing language, man. Oh, that you'd bear with me in a little foolishness, and indeed you do bear with, fool, you do bear with me. For I have, I, have, I have set you up for marriage. Set you up for marriage. I am, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, like this raging jealousy that's inside of me, for us to know who God is. I spend my whole life traveling, trying to just help people get who God is so crazy and I'm, I'm, I look in here and I'm like I don't see anything else that's all I see is is who my father is and he's so amazing and he came through Jesus and I'm jealous for people to understand the simple God just the simple gospel I'm not a technical guy I don't know a whole bunch of extravagant amazing I just know Jesus and I'm I, I think that the whole Bible is just about that this big book is just about that one little thing which is a huge thing right But I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband. I've set you up 
with one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin. So crazy. So, so I've betrothed you to one husband, that I, might, that I might set you up with him as a chaste virgin. And to me, that means, like, I, when I come to God, when I get born again, God looks at me as if I've never been with the world before. I've never slept with the world, period. Never slept with any of it. It's just completely gone, done, finished. I'm like a virgin. <laughs> and God looks at my soul as if I've never been with the world, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. <sighs> but I fear that just as Satan deceived Eve, so your minds might get corrupted and twisted and taken away from the simplicity and the purity that's in the Christ. Whew. This is where it's at, man. God wants our minds to be as if we've never been with the world before. That means that everything you were before you came to Christ has to go. And anything that happens after you come to Christ, if, if you confess to God, that's not who you created me to be, and you turn, you repent, you face the Father, it's as if you never did it. That's, that's real grace. Grace empowers you to walk out what truth calls you to. Since, since when did Jesus try to sin and get away with it? Come on, man, this is like love. I'm talking about love. Loving God so much that the things that violate his heart violate my heart. That the the stuff that I used to do, it's not a part of my life anymore. And then if it comes up, my, my senses become trained in righteousness to discern between both good and evil. It's a love life. It's amazing. That stuff's not an option anymore. That stuff that used to call my name doesn't call my name because self-control is being so focused on His voice that everything else loses its voice. None of that stuff can have a voice in you because you've heard your father. This is my son. This is my daughter in whom I'm well pleased. What God said to Jesus when Jesus came up out of the water, when Jesus had attained righteousness, when John the Baptist baptized Jesus... Jesus says, John, I need you to baptize me. And Jesus is like, or John's like, dude, no, 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 no. honey, you're coming to me, but I need yours. And come on, man. Jesus says, no, it's necessary so that righteousness might be fulfilled. What happened? When Jesus attained righteousness, when Jesus had walked out this thing, when Jesus had walked out the law, righteousness was fulfilled. And when righteousness was fulfilled for Jesus, God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Unless you step into the fulfillment of what Jesus did, you don't understand that God's well pleased with you because of what you believe, not because of what you do. And your doing becomes a byproduct of your being. Are you okay? Yes? I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, but just let me do it. (laughs) So at 11, my mom and dad got divorced, and I was really upset. And I didn't understand God. I didn't have Jesus in my family. My family didn't have Jesus. They weren't, like, worshiping God. I didn't come from a line of Christians. I didn't. Be careful not to say, well, you're lucky you came in the way you came in. Don't use, don't use my life and say, well, there's a reason why you love so much. I promise you, everybody has the equal opportunity to love if you just believe the truth of the gospel. No matter what, don't think that somebody that was a drug addict or has an amazing testimony has the right to love more than you. Self-righteousness is a horrible thing. Don't think that because you grew up in the church and you've been a Christian your whole life and you've been pretty good, your standard of good and God's standard of holy are completely different. And if you see the reality of this thing, what if, here, what I want to happen I want you. What if you never look back again? What if your voice of your past, the voice of your past, never had a right to your present or your future? Listen to me. I've been 12 years in the kingdom. I've been born again for 12 years. I've never had one day of guilt, shame, condemnation, or regret. 12 years straight. That's the only thing I'm holding to. The only thing. One thing I've laid a hold of. One thing I've accounted forgetting those things that lie behind and pressing forward to those things that lie ahead. Why? Because God forgave and forgot. He'll never bring it up again. God doesn't do any digging in the trash. God doesn't take a spotlight and try to shine it inside. God doesn't want me to look introspective. He wants me to look forward and things ahead. I know this sounds like a really hard word because a lot of people have been through a whole lot of different stuff. People told me that I couldn't be free and that I couldn't preach what I preach. But I promise you it's been 12 years and it's clearer than ever. What if you could live your whole life without looking back? 
It would just be the good news. Hope deferred makes your heart sick. Christ is in you. It's the hope of glory. There is no sickness of heart. There is no sickness if Christ that's in you is the hope of glory. Heaven paid such a high price to redeem you because you were worth the price to the Father. And God doesn't try to dig up your junk to try to get you to your present. So at 11 and a half, mom and dad got divorced. And, they, and my dad, uh, he left. I was really, I just freaked. I was like, this is so stupid. Why would my dad leave? I didn't see it coming. I had no idea. So mom and dad, they put me into a, a children's home. It was sponsored by a group called the Masons. So the Freemasons were over this place called the Masonic Homes. So they put me in a place called the Masonic Home. So I go in there. I don't know any different. I don't know what it's about. I have no idea. All I know is I'm, I'm a kid. There's a bunch of kids in there that are partying. So I figured, well, maybe if I party, this stuff will go away. So I started to get high. And it did. It went away for a little while. And then I get high again, and it would go away again. And all of a sudden, I stopped thinking about all the stuff in life because when I was high, I couldn't think about it anymore. So I wake and bake. So every day I spent high. So by 12 years old, I'm fully addicted to drugs. By nine years old, I was fully addicted to pornography. Nine. Nine! I thought the girl was what made me a man. That's twisted, man. God didn't create Adam. And then Adam had a problem that needed fixed, so he created woman. (laughs) Shall I paint a picture? God didn't create Adam, and then Adam had his manhood problem. I better make a woman quick to fix this. That's not why it happened. We've perverted the thing. We've twisted it, and I twisted it. No one taught me. No one told me anything. Parents don't even talk to their kids about this stuff anymore. You learn it from school. You learn it from TV, and it's really bad, and I learned really young. And I was really whacked out, man. Had no idea. So drugs ruled my life, man. I got out of this home at about 17. I got kicked out. I came home, and my mom was remarried. My stepdad tried to be the man. He wasn't the man. I told him who's the man. So he tried to be my dad. He wasn't my dad. And my dad couldn't even be my dad because my dad didn't understand who he was. And my mom didn't understand who she was or why she was on the earth. This is called identity crisis, and it's unfortunate that a lot of the church still has an identity crisis, and we need to understand who God's created us to be. Because when you look in the mirror, you should, with unveiled face, behold the glory of the Lord. You should see Christ in you, the hope of glory. He likes to live in there. He doesn't remind you about who you were. He thanks... Look, He doesn't talk to you about who you were. He tells you who you are. When you read the Bible, you find out what God says I am. Man, it changes everything. It's exciting. It's amazing. So I got kicked out of my house. I left. And my stepdad, one day, he says to me, he goes, you could never be a real man. I said, you tell me I could be a, come on, man. He said, real men are Marines. I said, dude, shut up, man. Real men, they're jarheads. He said, well, you could never do it. He said, I was a Marine. He challenged me. I said, I'll show you, dude. I'll show you who's a man. So I joined the Marine Corps. That wasn't good. I went to boot camp. I went down to Paris Island, and I did really well. I lost 73 pounds in boot camp in like 13 weeks. I mean, like they didn't let me eat, and they PT'd me until they physical trained me until I died. I mean, I was, I was a machine. I came out of there, and it was like, yes, sir, no, ma'am. I'm, everything changed. My mom was like, whoa, you've really changed. Yes, ma'am. You know, everything. <laughs> I went home, came back to base, went out to SOI, went out, started partying with the Marines again, started drinking, started all that stuff. All of a sudden, my life is worse than it ever was. Now I'm like doing drugs, getting high, partying, drinking, and I'm, I'm a Marine, And I'm like, okay, I want to go home. I don't want to be here anymore. And they said, sorry, you can't. I said, see you later. And I went anyway. That's not good ever. I went home, stole a bunch of money, went out west, hid in in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. I hid there because it was like beautiful. (laughs) Then I get arrested. I get put in jail. They put me in jail. They ran all my stuff, of course. They extradited me across America. They put me back in the military. They put me in military prison. I'm in there for a couple of months and... 
I'm like, this is like, I have a big mouth. I have a real problem with authority, like major. So that's not good in the military if you have a problem with your mouth. So my whole life I did. I was always loud for the wrong thing. I didn't realize why God gave me a voice. So lost as lost could be, they kicked me out. Or Oh, no, I, I ran away again. I went out to Colorado, and I got arrested again in a traffic violation a year later. Because after I got out of, the, out of the brig, I ran away again. A year later, all of a sudden, five cops with nine millimeters at my head put me in jail, extradited me across to America again, put me in military prison. And I was in there for a couple months, and then they gave me a, a bad conduct discharge and kicked me out. So now I'm out, and I have this on my record, and so nobody wants to hear that when you go to apply for a job. Hey, hire me. I I ran away from the military twice. I've been, grew up in a children's home, been a drug addict since I was 12. Can I have a job? So I, I just lied about everything, man. I had to lie. I lied. See, I lied my whole life about everything. I lied about everything. I lied about my age to get to get alcohol, a lot about my age, to get dates, I, whatever I had to do to get mine, that's how I lived. And so lying isn't a part of this. It's not a part of Christianity. And if we don't understand who God's created us to be, we might just bend the truth a little, but it's still a lie. It's not okay. But if your conscience gets washed by blood, you won't even be able to because you won't be able to live with yourself. And that's where we want to be. We want to be so in love with Jesus that we can't live with anything else but Jesus. And grace isn't a license to do whatever I want. Grace, it says, how, he, how shall he who died live in sin any longer? Reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to God. It's, it's exciting, man. What an exciting time. You don't have to one-up people. You don't have to lie on a testimony and try to impress other people. Just tell the truth, man. The truth will set you free. Live in a place of truth. Don't live in a place of bondage. Don't lie. Satan's the father of lies. Why would I want to live and promote his kingdom when Jesus said, truth, the truth shall set you free? You guys all right? I'm excited about this. I don't have anything else to talk about. (laughs) I just love Jesus, man. I just want to be simple for everybody. Just no matter what. Just it's simple. So I'm I'm lying on applications, getting a job, quitting, get fired, quit, get fired. And then I'm out at the clubs, you know, clubbing and thinking it's all good. And trying to find who I can date and go through all that stuff. Not for a relationship. I don't want a relationship. I just want one night, man. Who cares? about relationships so I meet this girl man and I trick her into thinking I'm this cool guy I'm like hey she's like what you know and I pursued her I would show up at her workplace man sit there for hours it was so crazy man I was like a stalker she actually said you were a stalker I was because no matter what I was going to get mine and nobody was going to stop me and that's how I lived my life I was totally full on so we end up moving in together, and I trick her into thinking I'm this amazing guy. And she's real, like, independent. She does the same job. She's worked the same job since almost she got out of high school. She's worked at a hotel, and she's just very independent, very, very... She's responsible, and I am irresponsible. So I trick her for a little while, and then she gets pregnant, and then we have our daughter. And when my little girl was born, I, I remember the night she was born, I was drunk... I was drunk all the time. When she was born, I I didn't know how to be a dad. And so I was like totally, totally lost. And I I remember looking at my baby, came out of mom. And I'm like, what am I going to do now? How am I going to do this? I I mean, there's not an instruction manual. And I didn't have like, my parents didn't know who they were. So how are we going to do this? So I became suicidal immediately. I thought of suicide. I went out and partied as hard as I could so I could just get life away from me. And then she told me, she goes, listen, she goes, I'm, I'm going to leave you if you don't straighten up. And I said, you, you better not. I said, I, I really will take myself out. I'll be done with life. You're all I've got. You can't, just, you can't just leave me. You can't just take my only kid away from me. And so she bought that for a little while. And then she's leaving me. And then I'm, these thoughts of suicide just ravaged my mind. And I would try to get high. And I'd come down. These thoughts of suicide would come back in. Then cocaine and all that stuff is mixed into this. So... I was living a horrible life. When I drank, everything would go away. But then I'd sober up. There's always a time of soberness where I'd need to get high again to fix it. 
And so this went on and on and on and on and on and on. And then she tells me a few months later, probably a year and a half after my daughter's born, that I'm going to leave you and find somebody to take care of me. And then all of a sudden, this, this rage and jealousy and anger filled my life. And I said, if you leave me for somebody, I will kill them. I will kill you. And then I will kill myself and leave our daughter with nobody. And I thought about it every day. And it's so... It's so real to me where I was and the mindset that I had. Even though my mindset's completely changed and transformed. I remember thinking about this, but I'll never revisit my past apart from the blood of Jesus. So never revisit where you came out of or who you were apart from the blood of Jesus. Or you ask a spirit of offense to come into your present tense and bear dead fruit in your present reality. Never ever revisit who you were apart from the blood of Jesus and the mercy of God and what he's delivered you from. That's, that's like so, so powerful and so amazing. So she stays with me and I'm, I am, I am this horrible man that can't work. She's working. I'm stealing all of our money. We go through bankruptcies, repossessions, all kinds of different stuff, man. And I've put our credit down under. We're living in a 1978 single wide trailer that I kept us in. All the windows are broken out of it. All holes in every floor, air conditioners in every, in three of the windows, I mean, we have, I have this basement that is full of, full of mold and full of bad. It's just bad. And I kept us there. I, 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 ripped, I ripped all of our money off. So we're like really done. So then all of a sudden I go and I see this, I see this thing in the paper that says there was somebody that wanted a singer for a band. And so I'm like, oh, no way. Maybe that's where I'll get my identity from. So I, I didn't know that's what I was saying, but that's what I was saying. So I went to try out for this band, and I made it as the singer. And I'm like, yes. And so now we're singing music where people are beating each other up, you know, and like moshing and, and kicking and stomping and yeah. And I'm like, yes, this is where it's at. And I'm a screamo guy full of rage. Now we're writing our own music, and we're planning on getting signed. That's our deal. We're going to get signed. And all the guys, are, one of the guys, I don't know if you know any bands that are in the world there's a band called disturbed there was a buddy of mine his he was the bass player for my band he used to play with danny one of the guitar players in disturbed and then danny left the band started the other band and they got signed so this guy is like i missed my shot you know so these guys are we're all like gunning for the same thing we're writing all originals and we're pretty good as far as bars and all that stuff goes am i okay i got an hour yet right yes okay all right so, so we're trying to get signed. We're trying to do this. And all of a sudden, like, my life is just completely, completely out of whack. The, guy, the other guys are pretty responsible. They're more responsible drug addicts. <laughs> like, they can hold jobs. And, like, one of the guys works at, um, two of the guys work at Harley. They got great, good paying jobs. Harley would never hire me because of my history. You know, I couldn't, I, for me, I, I have to lie on every job and lie on every resume and all that stuff. So nobody, and then the other guy, Harpo, he had his, this bass player. He had such an amazing job. These guys are responsible drug addicts. I don't know how you can do it, but they did it. They pulled it off. And so I'm as lost as lost can be. Then another guitar player comes in. He's like a really good friend of mine. His name's Bobby. And Bobby is like, he becomes like my closest friend. And so for years, we're like, we're this band that's coming up. We're trying to get signed and... And I'm just, man, man, this is amazing. So she stayed with me. Now my daughter is seven and a half years old. She, I, she has lived listening to her daddy, like, lie, steal, kill, destroy. She watches her daddy get out of the car and punch people in the car behind us because they beep the horn. I mean, my daughter has witnessed rage. My daughter at five years old was in front of the TV going, Jerry, Jerry, Jerry Springer. Like, that's how we grew up. That's, that's the real thing. Like, that's... So my, my kids cultivated in that stuff, and it's tragic our whole life. And so seven and a half years go by, and one night I come home, and my girlfriend is gone, and she takes my daughter. And I'm seven and a half years into this thing. I'm, I am like... I explode. I find a little note, and it's a little note from my daughter says that we're at grandma's house. Mommy's never coming home. She hates you. And mom threatened me all the time, but she finally did it. She finally got done. So I drove over to her stepdad's house because I wasn't allowed to own a gun because of my record and all that stuff. I just, if I would, I'd go to jail for like 10 years immediately if they caught me because of 
my testimony is real, man. I've been in and out of jail and all kinds of bad stuff. I'm, I'm blacklisted from Canada. I can't get into certain places. Like it's, the government doesn't understand that the blood of Jesus cleansed me. <laughs> so, so I'm like, I'm, I'm just like, I'm done. I drive to her stepdad's house. I'm getting a rifle because I'm going to end my life and be done with this because I don't want to be here anymore. I know my girl didn't leave me for somebody else. I know she just left me because I'm no good. And I realize I'm no good. Like, I have no idea how to do this. So I drive to her stepdad's house to get a rifle. And on the way to the gun cabinet, I pass by this phone book and I flip the phone book open and it opens to churches. Now, this is like... I have no clue who Jesus is, and I do not believe that Jesus is in a church. Like, why would he be in a church? Church is for people that are hypocrites, that they just go there to, like, praise God, but really don't do anything with what this... And I hear... No one has witnessed the gospel. I'm 34 years old. No one has shared the gospel with me my whole life. So I'm I'm 46 right now. I'm going to be 47 on Christmas. So I'm, I'm like 34 years old, and I have no idea who God is, and nobody has ever shared the good news with me my whole life in America. Nobody. No one's come up to me and says, hey, man, God has a plan for your life. He loves you. Nobody, man. And I was in America. And I, I understand I hurt people. But like those are the people that Jesus would be like, hey, dude, like that's real, right? Like, I don't know. That's the one I read about in here that the liars, the thieves, the prostitutes, the sinners, the worst of the worst, they wanted to hang with Jesus because he was like amazing. And it wasn't like Jesus was pointing the finger at them. They, he said some really, really convicting things, but they still wanted to hang with him because he walked it out. <laughs> so I'm, I'm as lost as lost could be. And I, I, I go to this church and I'm angry, man. I mean, like angry. And I walk in. I said, I need to talk to somebody. And this really happy guy, possessed by God. I can see it in his eyes. Like it says, the eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. But if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So if your eye, the eye is the lamp of the body. It says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy and thieves can't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. That doesn't mean lay up for myself treasures on thinking about Jesus is going to get me out of here because the rapture is not a rescue mission, right? It's the pickup for a wedding date for a bride that's made herself ready. It's completely different. We don't get born again just to get out of here. We get born again so I can represent him here and destroy hell while I'm here. So when I get there, more people that I cross paths of here will be there. Okay. So this guy, I see Jesus in him, but I can't understand what it is. I don't know the name of what I see. I just see it. And I said, dude, what is wrong with you, man? And I'm telling him all my stuff. And he goes, it's not what's wrong. It's what's been made right. I go, what do you mean what's been made right? And I said, dude, come on, man. Give me a break. And he starts talking to me about Jesus. I'm like, I didn't come here to hear about Jesus. He said, well, this is a church. Why did you come? I said, oh, God, man, I was going to kill myself. That's why. I opened some stupid phone book. And out of 586 churches, you're the one. <laughs> he says, why do you think that is? I said, I don't know. He said, well, since you don't know, can I tell you? I'm like, whatever, dude. So he starts sharing with me Jesus. And then he shares with me what Jesus did in his life. And I go, how, some di- how could some guy that died 2,000 years ago... How could this happen? He looks at me and he goes, well, that's just it. He's alive. And he goes, come on, man. Enough already, bro. What's wrong with you? I told you it's not what's wrong. It's what's been made right. And I'm like, okay, you're not even listening to me. He goes, I am. But what you're saying isn't helping you. I go, oh, you have something that's going to help me. Do you understand? I'm helpless, bro. I'm done. Finished. Did you hear my, did you hear what I was going to do? Did you hear what I've been? Did you hear what kind of dad I am? Did you hear about my daughter? Yeah, I did. But you're still not listening about Jesus. I'm like, go ahead, dude. So he shares the gospel. I'm like, whatever, man. He said, since you don't want your life, why don't you give it to somebody that does? That's what he said. Here's my response. Because I didn't understand how to talk. I wasn't churched. I had no clue. I said, whatever. If he wants my life, he can have it. There. I did it. 
He looks at me and he goes, amen. I go, what does that mean? I don't know what amen means. I heard people say it before, but amen. I said, whatever. I said, dude, I'm, I'm out. He goes, here's my number. You're going to need it. I go, I'm not going to need your number, dude. He goes, yes, you will. I go, dude, I don't need it. He goes, well, just in case you do, here, take it with you. I went, you know what, man? I'm out. I left. I went home, and for the first time in my life, I didn't want to kill myself. I was like, what is going on? Like I, that thing, that voice of wanting to kill myself. I didn't understand there was the seed in there. And I couldn't read, so I wasn't like I was going to nurture the seed. See, because if I don't want to get in here, I, I don't care who you are. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. That doesn't matter. If you don't get in here to find out who God says you are, you're in trouble. You'll, you'll never know. You'll never know who God says you are. And you don't get in here because you're in school. You don't get in here because you're at, I'm at Harvest School. Now I have to. Or you go to Bethel and now I have to. No, it's not about that, man. It's about getting in here because you, cause you want to. I get in here and say, oh my God, are you serious? Really? Okay. Really? Thanks. That's, that's my life. Every day. Oh my God. Are you serious? Okay. I remember when I first got, first got saved. and I'm like, God, yeah, but I know it says this. But, and then God's like, shh. I'm like, yeah, but there was a... <laughs> shh. Yeah, but look at this stuff. Shh. I'm like, okay. I love you. Okay. So I went home that day and, and I'm like, I don't want to kill myself. It's the craziest thing. I'm like, and right away, I, I don't want to get high. And I'm like, wow, like I have weed. I don't want to, I don't want to roll a joint. This is amazing. Like I, I, so what I did was I went home and I called my daughter because I knew she was at her mom, that my girlfriend's mom's. And I said, hey, she goes, daddy, daddy. I said, honey, you need to tell mommy that daddy found God. She said, what's he like? I said, I don't know. But I met somebody today that does, and he's going to tell me who God is. He told me, he gave me his number. He said, I'm going to have to call him. But anyway, you you make sure you tell mommy, daddy found God. She said, daddy, mommy's never coming home. I said, you do whatever you got to do. You get mommy home. Honey, you do whatever you got to do. Daddy's waiting. So she kicked and screamed and raged. And mom's an atheist, man. Comes from a line of atheists. No Christians in her family. Like, I don't come from a line. She doesn't come from a line. And so, like, we're, I'm the first one. And it's like, wow, how amazing. So she comes home and she says, I hate you. Now you're going to be a hypocrite. And I told her, absolutely not. Everything's going to change. I met this guy. He knows God. It's going to be awesome. You got to come meet this guy. I don't want to meet come some stupid guy. I, I hate you. Do you understand? I hate you. And, and she told me every day. I'm like, yeah, but everything's going to change. She said, oh, oh, really? Okay, you're going to get a job? You're going to work? At this time in my life, I had 30 jobs in nine years. Quit or got fired from everyone and never, ever gave a paycheck. My life, I was lost. And I couldn't sell drugs because I'd use more than I'd sell. So I couldn't even do that. Like, I was not responsible. So she ends up, I put my daughter to bed that night and told her everything's going to change. My daughter goes to bed. And in an hour and a half, I'm on the couch. You know, I can't, I'm not sleeping in the bedroom. In an hour and a half, that cocaine thing starts calling my name. And I left that night and went out on a binge first night. First night of my Christian confession. I thank God that the Bible doesn't say go make confessing Christians. It doesn't say that. It says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you shall be saved. Saved from what? And saved to what? If I got saved from something and saved to something, what are those two things? I got saved from a life of sin, of selfishness, of of all about me. 
and saved not just to get to heaven, but saved so that heaven can get into me and repossess that which was lost. And now it's my heart cry to find out what my father's heart cry is. That's what I've been saved to. I've been saved to relationship, which is more than just a theory and more than just a language. A relationship is a lifestyle. Jesus modeled what relationship looked like. He did. He said, my father's in me and I'm in the father. And then he says that we're in you. So crazy, man. What an amazing, awesome intimacy that we have. But I have no idea about this. And then I would call. I, that morning I came in. I'm, I'm as lost as lost could be. I'm out on a bench. I come home and I call. In the morning I get home and my daughter and my girlfriend are up on the couch. My, she's up all night. She has to go to school in the morning. My girlfriend said, I hate you. Look at what you're doing. Do you understand how much I hate you? You're such a hypocrite. I go, no, everything's different. She goes, really? Look at you. Tell me how your life is different. Tell me this. Rah, 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 rah. She's hammering. My daughter said, Daddy, you promised? I said, I know. I'm so sorry, honey. I don't, I don't, know, what, I don't know what to do. So I called Dan, this guy, this pastor, because he gave me his number. He said, you're going to need it. I do. I need to tell him how wrong he was and how twisted this whole thing is. I said, guess what, man? He goes, what? I go, it didn't work. I said, your little Jesus didn't work, man. The cross didn't work. This whole being born again thing didn't work. Here I am again. Same stuff. Last night, he said, Todd, he goes, how do you feel? I said, horrible, man. He said, two days ago, you wouldn't even have cared. Thank God there's a seed that's growing in you. And I said, make it grow faster, man. I hate this. I hate it. And here I was, without even knowing it, living underneath the law. And even though I didn't want to do it, I did it. Because it was sin in me that was making me do it. Very, very important that we understand this. You read Romans 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, the whole way together, you'll never see Romans 7 as a license to sin. Romans 7 isn't a license to sin. It's somebody that's trying to live and obey in their own strength and in their own flesh. You can't do it. You have to realize that righteousness apart from the law has been given. And and righteousness was imputed just for Abraham. Abraham, before he was circumcised, it talks about righteousness was given to Abraham. Then Romans 5 says that I have peace with God. I've been justified by faith. Therefore, I have peace with God. Peace with God can only be given when righteousness hits here. You can be right with God in theory, but not right with God in relationship. Not even, I'm talking about not the language of relationship, but the actual relationship that realizes that Jesus said, I have peace to give you that surpasses understanding. You can't get it through knowledge. Peace that passes all understanding. Not peace like the world gives, but peace that I've come to give you that settles everything. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened down by life. Come to me and I will give you rest. So people say, yes, and just like I did, they get born again and they say, yes, and he gives them rest. But until they learn from him and take his yoke upon you, for he is meek and lowly and gentle, take his yoke upon you. His his yoke is easy, his burden is light. And learn from Jesus. And you will find rest for your soul. He says, come to me and I'll give you rest. Now learn from me and you'll maintain it in here. But until we enter into that place, we live in the first place of rest, which leads us to anxiety and stress. So being born again is essential, but it's to unlock your potential. But you have to understand your identity and what Jesus did. He paid a price to remove your sins as far as the east is from the west. He paid a price to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. He paid a price to clean the inside of the cup so the outside would be clean. It's an amazing life that he's given us. It's a life of freedom. Because whom the sun sets free is free. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But where he's not, there's bondage. You can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You can pray in tongues. You can heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, and never understand who you are and who God created you to be. And those miracles will still happen through you and you'll stand before God and Him not know you. And that's not okay. We need to know that we're known by our Father right now and every second of every day so that our life never gets out of whack and we don't need someone to take us back to the very first principles and oracles of God. 
We need to stay in the strong foundation of right standing with God. Stay in the strong foundation of righteousness. Live in the purity and the simplicity of this gospel. Never allowing anybody to come in and twist this thing. The Holy Spirit's not for you to have a buzz, man. The Holy Spirit's for you to have relationship. The Holy Spirit's not here just to intoxicate you. And if he does, that's amazing. But make sure that you stay that way. Be in the world, but not of the world. Be in the world and be a light and a beacon in the place of darkness so we can represent light and crush hell for a living, never thinking like hell here. I'm excited about this. Because no matter where I'm at, the gospel is the same. I don't care if I'm in Europe, Russia... Africa, it does, it's the same. The same Jesus. The same Jesus is everywhere. People say, well, you know, Todd, you have to chill because, you know, you got to be careful because you're a culture. I will not sacrifice truth on an altar of trying to be culturally relevant to anybody, ever. No matter what. Ever. I'm in Europe and they say, well, you know, brother, it's different here. I mean, we grow up, we... We grew up drinking. I don't care. Drinking's not the culture of the kingdom. Amen. Well, you chill out, man. No, I'm not chilling out. I'm not. I won't compromise this thing. I don't care who it is, no matter what. I won't compromise to preach somewhere. I won't compromise for fi- nothing. Finances, no matter what. Nothing can take first place. Jesus has already taken it. I will not live in that place. I've already done it. I've already lived as a hypocrite. I've done it. I will never live. I'd rather die. I'd rather die. And I'm never going to die because Jesus said I'm just going to be with him. So He says, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who lives and believes in me will never die. To live is Christ and to die is. How can you overcome the enemy, little children? The blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony only? No. You have to love not your own life unto death. Don't get it mixed up. Oh, I'm a mess. He loves me. It doesn't matter who else does. He does. Dan was the only example that I saw of somebody that was possessed by God. This pastor I met. I was like, gee. He told me that day, it bothers you. I said, yeah, there was a time where it didn't. Two days ago, thank God, a seed's growing. I told him, make it grow faster. He told me, Todd, you need to get into the Word and find out what God says. So I tried, but my brain was so whacked, and I couldn't understand. I had ADHD, which I was was hyperactive about an attention deficit disorder. So every time I read, I'd be three words in and hmm, gone. I mean, I'd read a whole chapter, but my brain... I'll be, be riding a bike or climbing a mountain or jumping, swimming, whatever. Like, I'd read four or five words, and my, I don't even know where else. I don't know how I would. It's like driving somewhere and not knowing how you got there. Did you ever do that? Did you ever drive somewhere in your car, and then five minutes later, you, oh, my gosh. <laughs> so that's how my brain was with reading. And so my whole life, for 34 years, I never read a book. I couldn't understand how to read. So I went, my teachers kind of pushed me through. I was a bad kid, dude. They pushed me through. I didn't get good grades. I didn't pay attention. I slept a lot of times. I put my name on tests and just sign it. And, but they pushed me through. I was a bad kid. I was rowdy. I had issues. I'm so glad that Jesus canceled my lifetime subscription to issues. So Dan's telling me what I need to do, and I'm out on binges again and again. Now, third night in, I get born again. I'm I'm at my house. We have a band at my house, and they would come and practice and jam downstairs, and I'd be like, dude, you guys got to hear this, man. They're like, what? I'm like, dude, I found Jesus, man. They're like, shut up. They don't want to hear about Jesus, man. These are the functional drug addict guys. I'm like, I'm serious, man. He's real. They're like, dude, shut up, man. Please don't even, okay? Just chill out. The guy looks at me and he goes, dude, chill. Here. And he hands me a doobie. I'm three days old in Jesus. have no idea what this is. Not getting in the Bible. Dan is like my savior, like this pastor. Really. Tell me about Jesus. He had something in his eyes that was real. And I wanted to get it, but I didn't know how to get it. 
And so I get high, party with these guys. I'm like, dude, Jesus loves you guys so much, man. And I'm high as can be, stone, talking about Jesus. And instead of like, I, instead of knowing the living stone, I have to get stone, living. Because I'm messed up. So I'm telling Jesus, man, he's amazing. Dude, shut up. And I'm singing these lyrics that I wrote. And it's all about hate and anger and destruction. And I'm telling the guys, man, this is so weird, man. Stopping in the middle of songs like, dude, I, I can't sing this stuff, man. Like, what's wrong with you? Here, man, smoke another one. So we get high, drunk. We get done practice that night. And finally at the end, I'm like, dude, I, I need to learn and understand this. Jesus, you got to come meet this guy, man. They're like, shut up. I'm like, no. They're like, don't say it again. I'm like, Jesus, 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 Jesus. <laughs> the guys are like, that's it, man. We're done. We're out. Three of the guys bailed, left the band. And my one best friend who doesn't believe in Jesus, but like he's chill, he's passive. You know, you found your path. I found mine. Hey, it's good you found your path, bro. You know, he's chill like a hippie guy. I'm like, man, for real, you're not going? No, man, I, I love you, man. I, it's not about Jesus, but it's about you. It's about what you can do. I'm like, yeah, man. That's what I'm talking about. <sighs> Partying with him. Serious. As lost as lost can be. So he leaves that night. I go upstairs, man, fighting and screaming with my girl again, raging, same stuff, out on a Coke binge, boom, again. So the next time band practice comes over, I don't even show up. Bobby's at my house, like, coming downstairs just to jam. We're just going to play together. And I'm, but I, then the next time, like, I called him and said, hey, dude, can you come down? He's like, yeah, man. He comes down and he goes, hey, you live like 40 minutes from me. So it was a big thing. He's a stay-at-home dad. He has two kids. He's never, ever, ever, like... He's just a good dad. Like, anybody know anybody that doesn't have Jesus, but they're pretty good people? So he's one of those guys that has no need for, for God because he's a good guy. He can do it himself. His wife works. He's a stay-at-home dad, a three-and-a-half-year-old, seven-and-a-half-year-old kid. Great, great dad. Closet-taught musician, an amazing guitar player, like amazing. So I'm like, dude, like, let's, let's party. Let's do this. Let's do that. You got to hear about Jesus. Come and meet this guy, man. This guy's amazing. Like, every time I call him, he helps me. He's like, dude, I don't want to meet this guy. I know you, okay? And he was a hermit. He didn't want to talk to people. I was his, like, best friend. So, like, next time he comes over, I'm in. I'm out again. I'm upstairs this time. I come into the door. Bobby's already downstairs. I'm late. I come in. I had to get some. I was just doing stupid stuff. I come in. And my girlfriend says something to me. I go back in the bedroom and, bap, I punched a hole through the closet door. And I cut my hand. And I'm like, man. And I wipe off the blood. I go down my back steps. I went down into my basement where the band room was back there. Bobby's down there playing acoustic because he wouldn't turn plug in until I came down to plug in his guitar. I went down and I said, hey, man, Jesus loves you, bro. And I shook his hand. He looks at me and he goes, come on, man. Like, how long? Like, Dude, you've been talking about this Jesus for how long now? Nothing's changed about your life. You're still the same. You're worse. Why don't you stop using that name? If there is a, a God, he will be probably more mad that you're using his name. I'm like, dude, I'm telling you, man, he's real. You got to meet this guy, man. Bobby's like, I already rolled one up here. And I'm sitting there partying with him, getting high, just doing what I normally do, telling him about Jesus. And that night we partied, get done, and man, I am lost as lost could be. I mean lost, fighting with my girl, can't hold a job still, calling Dan. Every day I'd call him, dude, I did it again. I have to have this stop, man. We went up to this place called Teen Challenge. You ever hear of Teen Challenge? I went to this place called Teen Challenge just to visit because I came home after a binge and I'm like this messed up. Dan, someone talked to Dan and said, hey, you should go to this place called Teen Challenge. So I went up there. I met these guys. I go in there and the guy, it's like boot camp, dude. Like like the military, like same stuff, same authority, all that stuff. I'm like, I went up there and I meet this guy. His name's Maurice Washington. He's 28 years an IV cocaine user. He has track marks. Every vein is a track mark. I've never seen it. It's, he has like, like if not maybe not every, probably not every vein. That'd be a lot of veins. But his whole, all of his arms, his neck, all track marks, armpit, ankles, calves behind his leg. I never seen anything like it. And he's sitting there. He says, you just, you love your simple ways to me. And I go, what? And he said, yeah, how long will you love it? I said, man, what are you talking about? And he starts talking. I said, and I cussed him out and I left. I'm like, I'm not going there. Dan gets in the car. He's all quiet and calm. It's okay. Just in case. 
It's a great place. I'm like, dude, just you talk to me, man. He was Todd, I've been talking to you, but you're not opening the Bible. And you're not. But what I do and I try and I, every time I open, I can't understand anything. He says, Todd, you should just ask God. I go, I have asked him, man. And besides, why don't you ask him for me? He says, that's not how it works. He says, I can pray for you, but I'm like, whatever, man. Just, I don't want to talk about it anymore. Just take me home. So he takes me home and same stuff, man. Now I'm five and a half months in, five and a half months into this thing, and I am messed up. Messed up with a Christian confession. Messed up. So I go up home one night, and I'm, I'm out of money, and it's like 1 o'clock in the morning, and I go out, and all of a sudden I'm at, I'm at this place in town, and I call my dealer, and I, he's not home. I turn around, and there's my daughter, and there's my girlfriend behind me in town. Get in the car, Daddy. You promised you'd never do it again. And my girlfriend said, get in the car, you blankety, blankety, blank, blank, blankety, blank, screaming and raging. And man, for a second, I thought, man, this is so stupid. I can't believe this. And I got in the car, and I pulled out before them, and I lost them, and I, I, I got lost down in the city. And I went into a street that I never go into. And I picked up some kid down there on the, side, on the street, on, uh, on East Maple Street in York, Pennsylvania. Yeah, that's where I was from. So I picked up this kid and I told him I was a cop. Got him in my car. And he said, I knew you were a cop. This was after I had a quarter ounce of crack in my hand. And I told him he had the right to remain silent. Anything he says can and will be used against him in a court of law. He has a right to an attorney. If you can't afford one, won't be appointed to you. You have a right to a trial, speedy trial, all that stuff. I've been read my rights so many times, dude. <laughs> so this kid's in my car. He goes, I knew you were a cop. I knew it. And he's kicking the floor and hitting the dashboard. And, he, and I... I pulled over and I said, get out of the car and put your hands on the hood. And when he got out of the car, I hit the gas to get away. And he pulled out a 9 millimeter and opened fire at me from 10 feet away, if that far. And I heard an audible voice in my vehicle say, I took those bullets for you. Are you ready to live for me yet? I had no idea what it was. I thought I got shot. I thought I was hearing things. And I was hearing things. But the, the gun blasts from 10 feet away are so loud and so deafening when it's a 9 millimeter. The flashes of light went, lit up my vehicle. It was like I was seeing lights spinning out of town, hearing the voice. So you think, wow, that's an amazing testimony. No, it got worse. I went out of town, spun out, went out in the middle of the country, started breaking open all the bags, started hitting the pipe and smoking all the crack that I had stole from this kid from New York City. People say, well, it wasn't real. It was real. You know when you're a crackhead, you know the taste, you know it's real, and you're waiting for the euphoria, and the euphoria never came, and I couldn't get high, and every time I took a hit, that voice would say, I took those bullets for you, are you ready to live for me yet? I took those bullets for you, are you ready to live for me yet? Constant, all night long, same voice, kept coming, killing my buzz, killing my buzz, killing my buzz. Before, in the mor- I, 4.30 in the morning, I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm done, have no drugs, have nothing left, have no buzz. All I have is this voice that's tormenting me from the inside. So I drove to my house. I pulled in my driveway. It's starting to get light out. I looked at my car with my flashlight, and I had no bullets in my car. No bullets in my car from 10 feet away. And I said, what am I going to do? And I went to the door, and my girlfriend's on the couch sleeping, I put the key in the door. They both woke up. She just let me have it. And my daughter, Daddy, no. And that day I left, and I went away. And I went to Dan, and Dan told me that he was going to call Teen Challenge. And three days later, I'm on my way up to Teen Challenge. I go up to this program. I had dreads before, and uh, they were in rebellion. So I shaved my head down to the skin, like everything, gone. I'm like, I'm done. I'm done. See, resistance from the devil doesn't come because you fight him. Resistance, from the de- resistance of the devil comes because you submit to your father. But submission to the father isn't because you went to Bible school. Submission to the father is that you would allow what he says about you to be above anything else that this world says about you. That this would become the instruction manual to train you 
for what God created you to be. Now, keep in mind, I'm a guy that has never read before and I can't read, so I have a serious learning disorder. So I'm up at Teen Challenge. My girlfriend is glad that I'm gone. They sheriff sale. There were sheriff sale in my house three days after I left. My daughter is sad because I'm her only dad. My girlfriend is so glad that I'm out of her life, like done. So I go up to Teen Challenge. On the way, well, I called my friend Bobby and I told him that I was leaving to Teen Challenge and told him. And he said, well, that's awesome that you're going to go away and get help. And I told him I got shot at. And he said, well, you're lucky the guy was a bad shot. And I said, dude, it's not, he's not just a bad shot. Like, this is real. Like, I, this is a real thing. He's like, Todd, the only thing that's real is that you need help. And I said, I'm going to get help, bro, because Dan said the Holy Spirit's called a helper. He's going to help me. He goes, the Holy Spirit. He goes, dude, you got to stop listening to that guy, man. He's making your mind all messed up. I said, no, you have to meet this guy. He's, I don't want to meet this guy. I know you. I said, dude, Jesus is real. He said, don't you realize by now that Jesus isn't real? And I go, no, that's not true. Jesus is real, man. you got to meet him. He's taught he's not real. I said, I'm going away to rehab. He goes, good. He goes, we'll hang out in a month when you get back. I said, that's just it. It's a 12-month program, man. He goes, 12 months? He goes, why would you go away for 12 months to listen to something that's not real? I said, because I know he's real and that I've almost lost my life and I should be dead, man. And I still have this voice echoing inside of me that says, I took those bullets for you. Are you ready to live for me yet? I got to learn what his voice is, man. It's driving me crazy. He goes, Todd, he goes, it's about you and what you can do and finding the strength from within. You have to understand what you need to do. I'm strong enough to do this. So are you. I'm like, man, maybe you are, but I don't know. I'm going to learn about this Jesus, man. He goes, you're going to go away and find out Jesus isn't real. I go, man, you're wrong. Just because other people live like a hypocrite like I did doesn't mean he's not real. He goes, well, you're going to see. And I said, man, I'm leaving. I said, will you be back when I get home? I said, we can make music. He said, when you get back, we'll jam. You're my only friend. I go, awesome, dude. I love you, man. I'm not allowed to call you or write you or nothing. He goes, I know. You already told me. He goes, I'm okay. I'm like, all right, man. Well, I love you, bro. Can we get together before I leave? I leave in two days? He says, no. So two days later, I called, and I I left a message on his answering machine. I'm like, dude, I'm going away. I love you, man. Um, Make sure you check on Jackie and the kids are are in destiny because she doesn't, you know, Jackie doesn't want anything to do with me, but she knows you. You're a friend of the family, so if you can, please. And he didn't answer. I just left the message. I left. I went up to Teen Challenge. I submitted. I gave up, and it's like boot camp, dude. And I go in there, and I have no idea how to read, no clue. And I submitted. I surrendered. I gave up. Lost my daughter, lost my girl. I went in there, and every morning I would wake up. The first morning I was in there, I made sure I set my alarm for 5 in the morning because the day started at 6, and I would go in the prayer room by myself, and I would open the Bible. Now, I had no idea how to read, so I didn't know where to read, so I did this. And I would open it, and I'd be like, oh, my God, and I would shut it. Because <laughs> I, I honestly, and then I'd go through my day and go through training and go through school and all that stuff and still have no, just no clue. And, and it, it, it was hard for me. But three days in, they called me in the office, and Dan called me. And uh, the pastor, or the, that guy, Maurice, that, the guy that, was a, that had all the track marks, he was a counselor up there. He goes, talk, come in here. You need to talk to your pastor. I go, what do you mean? I go, dude, don't mess with me, man. I owed so much money for drugs, so much money for all this stuff. I thought someone came to my house and hurt my family. So even though she hated me, I didn't want her to get hurt because of my stuff, because I trashed everything. So he said, no, it's not. It's, uh, when I got the phone, he said, it's not, it's not Jackie. It's not Destiny. He said, it's Bobby. I said, what happened to Bobby? He said, he had a brain aneurysm. I said, what's that? He said, he's in a coma. I said, what do you mean, a coma? I don't understand healing, miracles. I don't understand nothing. All I know is I've given up, and Bobby's the only one that would listen to me. And I said, no, 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 no. He said, yeah, he says he's in a coma. The doctors don't know if he's going to live through the night. I said, what? I said, you're kidding me. And I freaked out. I screamed. I threw the phone. I went... I went out, it's, I almost ran out the door, but instead of running out the door, I ran up the steps and I went into the prayer room by myself and there was another guy that followed me in the prayer room and I'm like, no, not my friend. He's my only friend, the only one that stood beside me. Like, I ruined everything. And I'm back in the prayer room and this guy comes up and gets in my face. Now, I'm a fighter. I grow up 
fighting. You don't disrespect me. You don't dishonor me. All that junk, man. And I'm in this place. I've submitted. I've surrendered. But there's this fruit testing kid that's in Teen Challenge. He gets in my face like this. Fruit tester. But I don't understand. I don't understand anything. Like, I'm like, I'm raw. Like, and my best friend, the only one, I mean, all the guys in the band all bailed except this one guy. And he says to me, the guy gets in my face and he goes, it's not that bad, man. He doesn't know who I am, what I'm going through. He doesn't even know what the phone call was. And I said, no. And I screamed and I hit the ground and I'm on the ground and peace hit me for the first time in my life. I never had peace. And this hit me and, and peace knocked this kid, Micah, back in the couch And I'm screaming. I go, no, not Bobby, God, no, no, not Bobby. And I'm screaming. And I I have this still small voice say, you're not leaving. You're not going anywhere. And I just sat there in a puddle of mess. And Micah spoke up after, I don't know how long. It was a a while. It was within the hour because we had to be downstairs at 6. Or no, yeah, I had to be downstairs at 6 because this was nighttime. It was dinner. Micah said, what was that? I said, I don't know, man. I said, I don't know, but whatever it is, I need it in my life. He goes, me too. And this guy that I hated and hated me, we became best friends. And one day, a guy that I would hate in the natural, like God like did this amazing work. So I'm in Teen Challenge. My friend's in a coma. I'm up there for two months. A month and a half into Teen Challenge, I'm there for 12 months. A month and a half in, I open the Bible to James, and it says this. And, and it was like one morning, one of the Russian roulette days, you know. Because up there, they would have these scriptures. They'd give you this card. You'd look at the scripture. They'd turn it around, and you're supposed to memorize it. And my brain's so fried, dude. I can't remember anything. Like, I couldn't memorize. Like, I, could, I couldn't memorize to save my life. It was the hardest thing for me, let alone read. So James says, if you lack wisdom, ask God. And I'm there by myself. It's in the morning, and I went, oh, my God, that's it. That's it. I don't have a clue. And I went, I'm wisdomless. And I'm a month and a half into this program. I can't read. They're reading every day. And I saw this one scripture. And I'm like, I don't have a clue. That's the answer. I'm wisdomless. And I started to celebrate this. It might sound foolish to you, but I really, I was amazed. Because it was like God can work with that. But I didn't read the rest of the scripture. I just read that part. He who lacks wisdom, ask God. And I'm like, that's it. Help. I need wisdom. I have no idea. I don't understand anything. And it was like that one scripture started to open up to me. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And, and it, was, it was so crazy because then I would read. And I would, I would read it and be like, oh. and there was like bread, bacon in the oven. Like I couldn't, I couldn't define it or explain it. All I knew was that something was happening in me. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like I, I read, and I read Romans twelve two, don't be conformed to the world. I'm like, that's where I have been, just like the world, but be transformed, oh, by the renewing of my mind. That's it, wisdom. And it started to make sense. I'm like, oh my gosh, God, you're amazing. And I'm like celebrating, and I'm changing, like in the half, in a week period, like a month and a half in, and I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm telling everybody, like, this is so awesome. What is it? I don't know. But it's amazing. And it was like God was removing all my junk, like all my stuff. And he started to show me, and then the blood of Jesus, and then the reality of God, this, is, this made sense to me. This is the covenant I will make with them. Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Just that one, just that one thing. I'm like, oh my gosh, all the stuff I wish I never did. God said he's not going to remember it anymore. When does that happen? It happened two months ago. What? Where am I at now? What? Well, that's it. (laughs) People say, well, no, no, that's not it. No, that's it. I'm like, oh my gosh. And all of a sudden, like the condemnation is, is gone. I'm not condemned. I look in the mirror, I'm like, oh. I like what I see. I look in the mirror. I'm like, oh my gosh. I see you in there. I'm really not kidding. Like this is a crazy revelation. When you look in the mirror without a veil on your face. Oh my gosh, I see you in there. 
being transformed into what? Into the original image. What image? The image that God created me to be in the garden. As if I never ate the tree. Redemption doesn't just mean forgiven. Redemption means that it's as if I'm in the garden as if I never ate the tree. But the difference between the first Adam and the last Adam is that Adam went through the garden, was told by God not to eat the tree. The last Adam paid a price for God to come live inside of me, which keeps me from ever wanting to eat the tree. (laughs) It's really awesome. Like, why would I want to eat the tree when Jesus is the tree? I don't need this. Oh. So I'm starting to get so excited. I'm only, you know, a month and a half in. I meet a homeless guy one day. I'm, I'm across the street. Am I okay on time? How long do I have? I do? Oh, I thought 11.15. Yay! I was going to have to go. And get to the end. You guys good? Okay. So uh, I, I was across the street at, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, um, almost two months in. And this homeless guy comes pushing a shopping cart down Front Street in Harrisburg on the bike path right there on the Susquehanna River. And I had had privileges to go across the street and sit on the park bench. And it was overlooking the river. And I had some guy's guitar. I was just strumming the strings. I had no idea how to play it. I just I sounded good when I didn't touch the strings. And so the homeless guy is pushing his shopping cart. He's got army fatigues on. He's got a baseball cap and swim goggles on his head. And he's got floods on and sneakers on, pushing the shopping cart. And I went, hey, man. He goes, yes. I said, Jesus loves you, bro. And he goes, pushes his shopping cart off the thing, comes up to me, and he goes, I know how much he loves me, but you know how much he loves you. And I went, no. (laughs) No joke. I guess it's crazy. This is not often that this happens. <laughs> and I said, tell me. I didn't say, hey, I'm in Teen Challenge. I've been a drug addict for 22 years, and I'm up here, and I'm in this program. I didn't say that. He just looked at me, and I said, man. I said, tell me. He goes, he goes I'm going to pray for you today. And I go, okay. And he goes, and this demon's leaving you. And I went, demon? And then he told my friend that was sitting out on the bench with me, and my friend goes, who do you think you are telling me I have a demon? And I'm like. <laughs> this guy didn't know who I was. I didn't say anything. And then he just shared the word of righteousness with me. And I, I'm like, oh, my gosh, you're just like that Dan guy. Dude, I know another guy like you. And he starts to share with me. And he looks at me. And his eyes, I, they pierced, they just pierced. I could see Jesus in his eyes. Like this was crazy, a crazy time. If you picture the guy, he had swim goggles on his head. <laughs> see, army fatigues that are cut off, like not cut off, but that length. Just push sneakers. And he, and he prays for me. I look and his, I said, why aren't you out here? Why are you not in a church? Why are you not preaching the gospel? Dude, you need to be a pastor like my friend. Like he, he, you sound just like him. He said, 20 years ago, the Lord told me to pick up my cross and follow him. And I I gave everything. I sold everything I had. And I've been pushing this shopping cart across America, going from mission to mission, telling anybody who would listen about my king. And his shopping cart was full of Bibles. And I said, wow. And he said, thanks for blessing. He prays for me. I don't feel anything. I don't shake. I don't fall. I don't nothing. Prays for me. Real nice. Pleasant. Gives me a hug. Thanks for blessing me with your music. And I thought... I don't know how to play music. <laughs> and he pushes the shopping cart. He turns and he's on this path and it's a mile long street. It's Front Street in Parisburg if anybody's been there. So I walk across the street to the induction center where I was and the guys are on the porch making fun of me for talking to the homeless guy. Ooh, talking to the homeless guy, you know. And I said, guys, you shouldn't talk like that about people. And I wasn't trying to judge them or be mean to them. I was convicted. I was convicted. I turned around, and we all turned around, and the homeless guy disappeared off this mile-long path. Gone. He was gone. And they all ran inside afraid. And we went inside, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, man. I went into the older guy that that said, who do you think you are? Tell me I have a demon. That guy. His name was Sam. He was the guy that drank a fifth of vodka every morning before he'd run a backhoe. That's how he started his day. That's demonic. 
Here's what God got to say to you. I go, man, he just talked about rice. He said, who don't know who he thinks he is? And he turned around. The other guys won't even talk because they're all freaked out because the dude disappeared. We didn't know where he went. So that night, I went to bed. And at night, I, um, in my dream, I, was, I had these demonic nightmares every night when I went to sleep. I was chased by demons. I had, like, night terror every night, man. I mean, horrible, horrible, horrible time. I would scream, run around my room. Like, I would, I would sleep run, not sleep walk. I would, ah! And all the guys in my room were petrified of me because I was like, <laughs> I'm serious. I had, in the day, I submitted to God. But at nighttime, my brain was racked by this demonic stuff i don't even know how to explain it, it was just horrible but in this dream i i had this dream where i was in a valley and in the valley there was these mountains that were on the side but there were sheer cliffs there wasn't anything to climb and in my dreams these monsters would attack me and i would always hide or run and hide behind cars would usually be in the city my dreams would be so i could hide in alleys or whatever from these monsters that were coming after me and all of a sudden it shook and in this valley there was this grass that went way down and i heard a voice say do not fear i'll never leave you nor forsake you i had no idea what it was and i didn't see anybody but i woke up and it was like a couple minutes or one minute before my alarm went off and i went down to the prayer room and just like before like russian roulette i went down and it opens to psalm boy i almost did it that would be crazy it opened to this the lord is my shepherd and i shall not want And I'm reading, it makes me lie down in green pastures. And in my dream, it was a green pasture. It was the craziest thing. And he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And I I shut it and I went, oh my gosh. I was in the valley. He says, do not fear. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And I thought, what is going on? And then I went through my day, and I didn't tell anybody about my dream. And then that night, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Are you guys okay? Yeah. And, then in, and then in my dream, the next night, the same exact voice hit me. Do not fear, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. And it went, and shook, and I woke up, and I went down to the prayer room, and I opened my Bible, flipped it open, and it opens to the same spot. Second day in a row. I have no idea what's going on. And then I told this guy, his name was Sean, he was my roommate. This guy had OD'd three times, had died one time. He's 19 years old and severely lost and has been through way more addiction in his short life than I have in 34 years. And he's there, and this is his second time through. And I said, dude, I think God's trying to speak to me, man. He goes, what do you mean, Todd? Now, he's been through the program already. I go, man, I, last night I had these two dreams. He goes, well, what, what do you think he's saying? I go, I don't know, man. He didn't say anything except, do not fear, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, which is God. He goes, yeah. And he goes, what do you think it is? I said, I don't know, man. He goes, be careful, man. Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. I said, yeah, I don't think this was Satan, though, man. He goes, you just be careful, man. So the next night, I heard the same dream, same voice. And in the dream, a light went down the valley before me. And I heard, do not fear, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Go home. Restore family, friends. And I woke up. Now, I'm 10 months. Now, I want you to understand, my track record isn't good. I've quit everything in my life. I entered in for a year. So this isn't looking good for the home team, right? As far as the outside team's considered. So I'm like, I go down to my room. I pack my stuff. I'm like putting them in trash bags. Sean wakes up. He goes, dude, what are you doing? I go, I got to go, man. He goes, Todd. He goes, you're being deceived, man. He goes, there it is. I told you Satan can disguise himself. I said, no. I said, this wasn't Satan, man. And the light that I saw, I know it was God. I said, I know it was God. I go, this is amazing. And he's like, Todd, it's not amazing. And all the guys in my room are like, you can't do this. You can't just leave. You can't just, I go, I got to go. Took my stuff in a trash bag downstairs. And there's Maurice, that Maurice Washington guy, the guy with the track marks. He goes, Todd, what are you doing? I said, I got to go. He goes, you got to go? Let me tell you something. I've been in Teen Challenge five times. I went through one time and I left four times early. The last boy that left before you died in two weeks. And two weeks after he left, they found him dead in his bed to a heroin overdose. I said, that ain't me, man. He goes, oh, that ain't you. Let me tell you something, Todd. And bang, he's just let me have it. 
I'm like, man, you don't understand. He goes, no, I do understand. You are stuck on stupid. That's what he said. And it was amazing because God had already set me free from being hurt by people. I can't even explain it to you. Dude, I've lived without, without being offended. Like, this is the first day of my chance to be offended. And I'm like, no, he's real, man. He, he's real. I know he's real. You think that you know he's real. You've been here two months. You have submitted for two months, and now you're leaving. Now you got to go. You can't stay. Because a little leaven leavens a whole lump. And he's, he's just hammering me with scriptures that I never even read before. And I'm like, okay. And I called Dan. I said, hey, I said, I need you to come get me. He goes, Todd, is this God? I said, I met Jesus last night. He said, I'm on my way. And they took me out in the front porch and made me sit there. And I sat there by myself. And I was crying. And I was thanking God for freedom and how much he loved me. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. Like, God, I love you so much. You're so awesome. And another counselor comes out. This guy had been through Teen Challenge twice. He was a counselor. He came out, and he was real clo- we were close together. We talked and stuff. His name was Phil. He comes out, and he goes, Todd, he goes, you think you met Jesus? I said, yeah. He goes, I hope you're right, man. And he's crying. He goes, because I really like you, man. I go, me too. I go, but Jesus set me free. He said, go home. I go, I got to go tell my daughter, man. He's like, well, you, what are you going to do? I said, I got to go tell my daughter. I'm a dad. Like, I... I know I'm a dad. Like, I didn't know I was a dad. Like, I, I can't even explain to you. I didn't know I was a father, and she's already seven and a half years old. And I know I'm a father now. And it's like, I know I'm immature and two months old and excited. But, man, Dan takes me. We stop at the church first. That didn't go over well because the elders paid for me to go for 12 months. I left 10 months early. It wasn't good. So, but I had to go to my house, not to live there, but I had to tell my daughter that I was sorry for all my stuff I did. My daughter comes running out of the house. I'm talking seven and a half years old. Boom, tackles me. I said, hey, you, I love you. She goes, daddy, I'm, you're home. And I said, no, daddy's not home. Daddy can't live here, but daddy loves you. I'm so sorry for all I've done. She goes, for what, Daddy. I said, for all the times daddy has been out on drug binges and selling drugs and doing all these horrible things and for all the nights that mommy kept you up, daddy, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just so glad you're home. And I'm, my kid's seven and a half, so like they're resilient. Kids just bounce back and I'm holding her and I'm like, hey, did you hear me tell you I'm sorry? She goes, yes, daddy, but I still don't understand why you're home. Why, why you're sorry. Now you're home. It's all okay. I'm like, it's not okay. Daddy really ruined mommy's life. And mommy came out. I said, hey, I'm so sorry, honey, for all the stuff I've done. It's like I make reconciliation. I did a lot of damage. I said to her, I'm so sorry. She said, I know you are. She said, when you went away, I gave my life to Jesus. And I thought, oh, my God. Oh, my God. And then my first, here's my first conviction. This is amazing. First conviction that came. This is it. She says, I know you are. I gave my life to Jesus when you went away. I said, I cannot live here. I cannot live here. Why? Because love had taken over my heart. And love isn't a compromise. And so it would have been so easy to just move back in. My daughter said, Daddy, you're home. No, I'm not home. I'm not home. Daddy's out, but he's not home. I'm going to show you what it's like for me to be a father, to provide for you, to help you, and to be there for you. But I cannot live here. And my girlfriend looks at me and she goes, no, you cannot. We need to be married. And I said, oh, my God. I said, are you serious? She goes, yeah. I said, I looked at Dan. I go, dude, we got to plan this, man. He looks at me and he goes, you're not planning nothing. He said, I've been pouring into your girl and your daughter when you've been gone. And he was there just talking to my family, nurturing them. And my girl looked at me and she goes, you can't live here. I said, no. And I'm so convicted. I'm talking like convicted. A lot of people are like, oh, wow, hey, it's love. It's not love. Love isn't compromised. That's not love. Thank God Jesus didn't live in compromise. Thank God Jesus didn't compromise his life because he could have never paid the price for us because he had to be pure and holy and without spot, and blameless, and sinless, and walk out the whole law without missing one, in order for us to be right. 
So my daughter is out in the porch. I'm holding her. And I looked. And all of a sudden, my heart is pounding. Boom, 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 boom. And I'm so convicted again. See, the Holy Spirit, when he's poured out, God said he's going to do three things. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit, when he's poured out, he's going to convict the world of sin because they don't believe in me. Of righteousness because I'm going to go to be with the Father. And of judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. So I'm on the porch and I'm convicted. See, God removed my past as far as the east is from the west. But now I'm convicted of something else. I'm convicted because I know that inside of my house there's nothing clean. Inside of my house, it's full of pornography, it's full of drugs, it's full of paraphernalia, it's full of all the junk that I wish I'd never done. So my heart is pounding, and I'm not going to just move back in because we need to be married, but I'm so convicted in my heart right there, I'm pounding. And she goes, what's wrong? I said, I I need to take care of some things, I need to clean out the house right now. And I looked at Dan, he goes, okay, I said, can you please watch my girls? And I went in the house. It was so amazing, this new relationship with God. God's eyes are on me. Like, he's still on me today. He's on me all the time. My heart's so convicted of my father's eyes. See, he gazes at me, and he never looks away. He sees everything. He sits in the theater room of my soul, and he sees everything that goes across my screen. That's our father. That's who God is. So he sees everything that I view, everything that I think about, everything that I hear, everything that I see. He sits and it says that his word judges the thoughts and intents of my heart. But the truth is, is that Jesus is the word and, and he's the word that made, was made flesh. The word that was made manifest, right? So as we get into the word and as we get into truth, what happens is the word comes in and God wants our flesh to become the very word that we say we know. But the Holy Spirit comes and convicts us of the things that need to change. And then all of a sudden, God, we start to position God in our soul and he sits in the theater room of our soul and he sees everything in my life and the closer i get with intimacy the easier it is for him to pick and pluck and prune and trim and get everything out because what he wants to do is he wants to trim us back and he wants us to bear much fruit and that our fruit remains but it has to start with righteousness because righteousness bears its fruit unto holiness oh I hope that this is making sense to you because it does to me. I'm going to live free. I'm going to live pure. I'm going to live and I'm going to be holy just as he is holy because that's what God says to do. And that came from Peter. Peter. The one that denied Jesus. The one that was called the devil by Jesus is the one that says be holy as he is holy. People are like, oh, I can relate to Peter. Well, good. Which one? Before he got saved or after he got saved? Because there's a difference. So I'm so convicted. I go through the house and I went through my kitchen and I got all my junk. And I went through and all the way through the house, went back to my bedroom. I looked at the holes that I had punched in the wall. God forgave me. I'm not that man anymore. I'm no longer a man of rage or wrath or anger or malice. I'm not a man of slander. I'm not a man of judgment. I'm not a man. I'm not a hypocrite anymore. I'm like... I'm like free and God's forgiven me and washed me clean and he loves me. He loves me. I have a daisy. He loves me. 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 See, when you enter into a place of twistedness and when you enter into a place of sin, you separate yourself from receiving his love and you can't afford to live in that place. You let go of the sin that so easily ensnares people. And don't neglect such great a salvation as this. It's an amazing love that we have. Ooh, I got to finish the testimony. We got a little extra time. I got to get to the end so you know I'm saved because, gosh. Can I get someone to come play guitar? <laughs> oh, holy Lord Jesus! Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, Lord, oh, God, you're amazing.
thing and you created us to be just like you. Oh, holy. Mm -hmm. You don't have to play that. You can play whatever. So I went through my house and I got everything in a trash bag. And this is the honest truth. And this is what happened to me. I was so convicted of all these things. Not because if I didn't get them out, I would use them. See, this is the difference. I'm not removing them because they're a vice in my life and they're going to manipulate me. I'm removing them because the fear of the Lord has hit my heart. And it says that, it says that you've come to need milk instead of solid food. For solid food is for the mature who have their senses trained to discern between both good and evil. See, what happens is righteousness trains your senses to discern when something's wrong and something's right. No, we all have a sense of consciousness and we all have a sense of knowing that something's really wrong and something's really right. But then there comes this other area where something could be right. And then the Holy Spirit starts to train us and gives us God's heart. And so we realize the things that are a violation to His heart can no longer be okay with mine. And then God starts to train my heart and then all of a sudden... There's no possible way for me to allow this stuff to exist anymore because this is a violation of relationship. So on that day, that day, I mean, it's obvious what's good and what's bad, but my house is full of darkness. And I go through the house and my heart's pounding on the porch because I got to get rid of my junk. And I go through and I put everything in a hefty bag. No one looks at, no one's in there. My wife's not, my girlfriend's not in there going, hey, uh, yeah, what about that? How about that? She's not. God is in my soul going, this has to go, this has to go, this is not okay, yes, this is not okay, he's not ruling me like a taskmaster, he is leading me like a lover, and he's changing everything inside of me, and I go out the back door with all this stuff, and I go down the back steps, and they creak, and I go down to the burn barrel, and I put everything in a barrel, and I went to the garage, because I couldn't fit everything in, and I took a sledgehammer, and I sledged it all down, and pounded it. Really, just me and God. No one's watching me. Pastor's not watching me. Nothing. None of that stuff. My father is. And I realized my whole life had been a lie. My whole life had been sin. My whole life had been tragic. And I'd made it all about me. So all the me stuff is going. So I go out to the barrel and smash this down, pour gasoline on it, and lead a trail. And I sat over here with a, with a light and I lit that thing and it went over there and it burned, went up in flames. Big, big flame. I put a lot extra on there. And I'm so excited because when it dies down, I went over, G, over there and I worshiped Jesus over my past. This has never had a, a vice in my life and never had a voice in my life. Pornography left that day all my porno books all my stuff all that stuff I thought made me a man was burning (laughs) I'm so serious see people said that you can't live without that you're wrong Job 31 1 says I made a covenant with my eyes to not look lustfully upon a woman ever again and and that day God did something in me and completely cleansed me and rid rid me of this and I worshipped Jesus over this I went up on the porch and I told my girl we planned on on getting married four days later in between first and second service we weren't going to plan it because no one was going to come anyway I mean who was going to come send out invitations to everybody that I heard like no one's going to come anyway I mean her mom came and freaked out on me and screamed and cried because I ruined her daughter her stepdad came to my wedding and cussed me out her brothers came and said whatever dude my mom not I mean I, I ruined everything and it didn't matter because on that day I was making a covenant not a big wedding a big covenant it wasn't about a big wedding and when we came together it was like the first time we ever came together I can't even, there's something to be said about living in a place of love with God to where when you get married it becomes this amazing intimacy where the two become one even if you're in a relationship for 10 years before it's as if you were never together when you first come together because God is a God of covenant and God 
takes old things, makes them pass away, and he makes all things become new. Listen, no matter who you are as a woman, there are people that have given themselves to to things and guys that have given themselves to things and and they they get saved and they wish that they were never the person that did it and and then God's better than that he makes you as if you were never the one that did like we've had prostitutes that have been and had abortion after abortion after abortion that they get saved they get completely radically changed by God and then on their wedding night they lose their virginity like guys God's way bigger than better than and better than you think he's He wants to make old things pass away. All things become new. God is such a God of the impossible because nothing with God is impossible. But He takes you and He makes it as if you've never sinned, as if you've never missed it. That's the God that we serve where His mercy is new every morning. He's that good. And when you see how good He is, all of a sudden the last thing you want to do is sin and get away with it. Because I exit this amazing covenant that I have with my Father when I enter into this place. And what is a moment in the flesh? What is a moment in the flesh? It's no good. We need to live in the Spirit and live in God. And those that are led by the Spirit are sons, are children of God. God's amazing. He wants to make old things pass away and all things become new. There are people that have got STDs and stuff in their bodies from sexually transmitted diseases from a life that they wish they'd never lived. There are people that have lived in drug addiction and they have hepatitis C or they have drug addictive things in their blood or HIV or whatever, hepatitis C. God wants to make it as if you were never the person that stuck a needle. God wants to make it as if you were the never the person that slept with somebody out of wedlock. God makes, he, that's how he is. That's who he is. People say, that's too good to be true. No, you're wrong. He's so good. He is true. He's so good. He is true. I remember the first time I, I, I baptized these, these girls that were cutters. They were, they had cut themselves and they were in a life they wish they'd never lived. And man, they were hooked on drugs their whole life and then all of a sudden they get saved they get baptized in water come back up and all the scars are gone man all four in a row because righteousness makes old things pass away all things become new and all of a sudden who you were doesn't exist in the eyes of the father that says who you are so a couple of days later my wife and I get married it's amazing yay She's been my wife. We've been married now for, for 12 years. We have that 19-year-old who was seven and a half. We have a 10-year-old, a five-year-old, and a little boy that we're adopting. But I want to tell you one more thing, and then we're going to pray. You guys okay? When I see Heidi coming, I'll just kneel. <laughs> the day after my wedding... I really heard in my heart to go visit my friend Bobby because Bobby was that guy that was in my life. He was in a coma. He was up at this brethren home, like a, a retirement home. He was on life support. And I went up there. I took my daughter with me because my daughter was a friend of Bobby. And I went up there, and there he is on life support in a coma. And I'm, I walked into the room, and I told his wife, I'm so sorry for all I've done. She said, for what, what did you do? I said, man, I, I, I didn't represent Jesus. She said, Jesus, look at my husband. You're going to tell me about Jesus? And I said, he's real. I'm telling you, he's real. I, I, Shut up. And she's screaming at me. And here, his brain's cut away, his skull. He's got bandages because of a, all the stuff that's happening. And I knelt inside of the room and I said, I'm sorry. To my best friend, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I'm singing at the top of my lungs in this place. And Betty's in the corner going like this, covering her ears. And Bobby's there on the bed and he's not blinking at me. He's not winking at me. He's in a coma. And I said, I'm so sorry, man. Jesus is real. And for 30 seconds, God allowed me to see the reality of of my five and a half months of hypocrisy. And my friend, I'm sitting here and all of a sudden God's like, he's showing me, hey, Jesus loves you. Hey, man, God loves you. Me upstairs raging. Hey, Jesus loves you. And he's showing me Bobby's perspective of who I was as his only friend, but living as a hypocrite. Because your life is a whim and a vapor and you are here today and gone tomorrow. And you can use this life for whatever you want to. But I promise you, hypocrisy does way more damage than you think. 
But if you see who God created you to be, then you won't have to have a Bobby in your life. He was my best and only friend at the time. And I told him how sorry I was. And the next morning, he died. And it was the hardest thing ever. And they called me and told me. And Betty said, Todd. Two days later, she said, Todd, you were Bobby's only friend. He would have wanted you to speak at his funeral. And I thought, oh my God, what am I going to say? And God just spoke to me all night long. And he told me, I just want you to share what it means to be a friend. And I realized that I wasn't a friend. Even though I would call him my friend. I wasn't a friend. And I get there in the morning and I'm, I'm lost, man. Because Bobby's in, in, the, in the casket, open casket. All these people are there. None of them know Jesus. And here I am, the only person that was in Bobby's life that could have been a personal witness to him. I was the only one he'd listened to. And I just sat back and I said, God. I looked and he's in there, eyes are closed, coffin. I watched this little three and a half year old kid come up to that coffin and shake it and say, Daddy, wake up. And I thought to myself, oh my God. And I just sat back. And I watched the kids sit on the front row, stone cold, stare. And I got up to share and I was a mess. I was so messed up. And my wife is there, brand new wife, you know, the one we've been to. But she knew who Bobby was and my daughter and... I said, I'm sorry. I said, I wasn't a friend. A friend lays his life down for his friend. Jesus laid his life down for me, but I didn't know what that meant. And I looked and I apologized to the kids and I said, I'm sorry. I didn't walk out Jesus in front of your dad, but I promised you that it'll never happen again as long as I live and I will live fully committed to this gospel. And they don't know what gospel I'm talking about. All I'm telling them is I lived as a hypocrite in front of your dad and didn't live Jesus at all. And there's only one name under heaven that men can be saved. And his name is Jesus. And your daddy told me before he died, the day before he died, I don't believe in Jesus, but I believe in you. And me can't take your dad to heaven. And I'm sorry. Pretty much I had to tell the kids that their daddy's in hell. That's a horrible, horrible thing. And I told him how sorry I was. And half the funeral home gave their life to Jesus that day. I was such a wreck. I was so messed up. But I lived a hypocrite life. So I'm just going to ask you, man. Like, listen. This ain't no joke. This is a big deal. See, we say that, that sin's okay. Sin sends people to hell, man. It's not okay. My life, I lived as a hypocrite. I lived in this place. I didn't know. I didn't understand. But then I woke up and I saw and I understood. So my, my heart cry is this. Wouldn't you like to understand and wouldn't you like to get hit with just the reality of the conviction of righteousness? Because the conviction of righteousness, its fruit is holiness. So God loves you, but don't let grace slip into your life and think that it's cheap because it's not cheap. Someone paid such a high price to make it easy for you. And Jesus is the easy button. Don't think that getting high with Christ is okay because it's not okay. Because there's no high like the most high. I hear people say, well, God made weeds. Stop it, okay? Just stop being silly. God made, like, cocoa beans, too. God made poppy seeds. Does that mean the heroin should be legal? What are we doing? Why should we comp... Well, Jesus, they called him a wine bibber. Does that mean that you should get drunk and say it's okay? It's not okay. It says, let nobody get drunk with wine, but be, but be filled with the Spirit what it says that's the gospel that's the goodness of God God wants to fill you with all of his fullness and it's all according to the love of God that's in Christ Jesus see the truth is is that God sees where you've been and understands it but he forgives you and he doesn't just forgive you he forgot it he wiped it out as if you've never sinned he sees you as if you never ate the tree that's how good our father is I promise you and if you would just dare to give yourself to him fully And completely, he would completely yank out, rip out, and completely obliterate all that stuff that you wish you'd never done. Are you with me? So look, here's the deal. You got stains in your body from yesterday? Jesus wants to remove them. I'm serious. He's real good at this. See, God doesn't want to leave you with a disease that came from drug addiction if it's not the person that you are anymore. He wants to remove the stain that came through sin too. 
He removes the sin, but he also removes the stain that sin brought into your body. He crushes that thing and makes it as if you never did. Which is more humbling, going back to the doctor, getting a hepatitis test and finding out it's gone from your body? Or are you keeping it forever like luggage? Come on, man. It's not who you are. It's not who you've been. This is the goodness and mercy of our God. This is our King of glory. He is the King of glory. He is amazing. He is beautiful. Look, hypocrisy ain't no fun anyway. It's no fun. Come on. Let's worship Jesus a little. Ready? Can we do it? Are we allowed to? We're going to do